This week we're talking about John Rawls, who is uh, one of, if not the most, famous political philosopher of the last hundred years. Uh, Rawls is known for his liberal egalitarianism. Uh, so roughly, liberal here doesn't mean the same thing it does in uh, political debates, right? So when we say the word liberal, we're not meaning what the Fox News correspondents mean. When we say liberal here in political philosophy, what we mean is there is a certain set of intuitions about what's fundamental, uh, what's fundamentally important when we're trying to organize our political lives together. And for liberals, uh, two of the most common values that they think are fundamental are liberty or freedom and equality. And so in the liberal tradition, there's this idea that we're all just sort of fundamentally equal. Sure, there are differences between us, but as humans, we're all sort of of the same uh, starting worth, right? So we're all e uh, worthy of equal respect. But also that there's a freedom we all have, and this is a freedom to uh, really use our own mind, use our own rationality to come up with what we think a conception of the good life would be. Right? So by the good life, I mean we have this ability to think of what the best way is to live a life. And we should be free to do that and to follow that conception of the good life as much as we can without impeding other people's ability to do so. Right? So we're all sort of fundamentally equal. And we should all have the freedom to uh, chase after whatever we think is important in life so long as we're not stomping on other people's freedom. So those are two sort of basic liberal traditions, uh, thoughts in the liberal tradition, sorry. So Rawls is in that tradition. He thinks those are two important values any theory of political philosophy has to take account of. Uh, in addition, he's known for his egalitarianism. Uh, so... This can take a number of different forms. Uh, some people think you should um, be a wealth egalitarian so that all of your uh, primary goods, all of your money, health care, so on and so forth, all the things we all need to survive are just distributed uh, perfectly equally. That's not what Rawls is thinking. Uh, Rawls thinks in terms of our opportunities. So. When we say he's a liberal egalitarian, what we mean is he cares about those values of liberty and equality, and he wants us all to have an equal opportunity to lead a good life, to follow our conception of the good life and have this sort of equal opportunity to do so with everybody else in society. Okay, so there's a lot we can say about Rawls, far too much to cover in a single week. Uh, but I think here are three of the most important things. We'll break this into three different lectures. So the first deals with this idea of a birth lottery. If you haven't heard what that is before, don't worry. We're about to explain it. But here's a, a first question for you. What do we deserve as people? Right? What are we um, supposed to get just out of nowhere? Right? What do we deserve for being a uh, free, rational human being. Well, think about where you're currently at in life, right? So whether you're struggling or doing very well, doesn't matter. Just think of where you're at in life. Now think about how much of that is due to circumstance or maybe even due to luck, right? So think about where you're at. How much of that was set up by where you were born, what your parents were like, what class your parents were in uh, when you were born and growing up, what neighborhood did you live in, what was the socioeconomic climate in your neighborhood, uh, do your personal talents, right, so you have some natural talents, we all do, do your particular natural talents line up with the economy, Right, so think about how all of those things really affect where you're currently at in your life. It seems like these affect us pretty strongly, right? So if we're born into an upper class, uh, our school systems will be better because the taxes will be uh, higher in our area, so we'll be able to fund better schools. Uh, 
in higher income neighborhoods, children are more likely to go to college, uh, so on and so forth, right? Parents can buy them cars so it's easier for them to get jobs because they have an easier way to transport themselves back and forth. Right? There are all these different benefits that come just with being born into the upper class. There are all these different things that come just with being born into particular neighborhoods. Right? So if you're born in rural Kansas, your life prospects are going to be very different than if you're born in the heart of New York City. And then also think about your personal talents, right? So for those of us who have uh, personal talents for the arts, right? So some people have a personal talent for playing an instrument or painting. Well, it just so happens that, unfortunately, those personal talents don't tend to line up with the economy very well, right? But if you have a personal talent for accounting and mathematics, well, then your talents do happen to line up with the economy. So just by sort of what you were born with, it can affect uh, your life prospects. Now, the important thing for Rawls is he's going to claim most of these things are just the result of pure luck, right? And this is where we get this idea of the birth lottery. So at birth, as fetuses or babies or toddlers, right, we don't deserve any of the things we have, right? We don't deserve the family we were born into. We don't deserve the culture, economic class, talents we're born with. Think about that for a second, because that's very important. Now, you haven't done anything yet, so you can't deserve these things. It seems like it's just pure luck that you're born when, where, and to who. With what talents. Those all seem like just a roll of the dice, right? You could have been born to a rich family in Europe, or you could have been born to a family in extreme poverty in Africa. Right? You just happen to be lucky enough to be born to the parents you were born uh, to and in the place you were born at, so on and so forth. Right? So even, even for some of us who uh, still have it pretty rough in the U.S., right, we're still comparatively lucky to people starving in the third world. So you were just lucky to be born where you were, and then maybe unlucky in certain ways relative to other U.S. citizens. Right? But the big point here is it all just seems like sheer luck. If the genetic dice rolled slightly differently, you could have had different talents, different demeanors, different character traits, so on and so forth. Okay, so why is this important? Well, he thinks our life choices are very heavily affected by these things, and that just doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem fair for our life prospects, our opportunities in life, to be so heavily affected by things we don't deserve, good or bad. Our life prospects seem to be too heavily influenced by luck. And so Rawls thinks this is a failure of our society to accord with justice. In some sense, justice has to encapture this idea of fairness. So he thinks insofar as we're letting luck uh, control us, we're not really serving justice because we're not making things fair. So one of the major roles of political philosophy has to be to take this into account. Realize that there is a birth lottery. We don't deserve so much of these things, uh, so many of these things, and uh, we need to do something to accommodate for those differences at birth. So I already talked about some of these examples, uh, but I'll just mention them again quickly. All right, so it's clear that people born into poor economic classes have less of a chance of going to college. Um, I didn't put any of the citations here, but you can look that up pretty quickly. Uh, it's easily found information. Uh, but think of all the reasons why that could be. Right, so if you're born to a poor economic, uh, born into a poor economic class, it's very likely that your family doesn't have enough to afford a private university or a state university. Your grade school education is likely to be worse because your grade school, uh, the school districts, are funded by your uh, property taxes, and the property taxes in low-income neighborhoods are obviously lower than the property taxes in high-income neighborhoods. <coughs> so the schools don't have as much funding if you're born into uh, poorer economic classes. So there is just a few reasons off the top of my head, right, that show people just born by sheer luck into poor economic classes 
uh, have less of a chance of going to college, and that doesn't seem fair. We already talked about this too. People born with natural talents, uh, not suited for the current economic market. That's just all about luck too, right? So you could have somebody who's an extremely talented painter uh, who just has no uh, applicable skills to our current economy. Then you could have somebody with a natural talent for numbers and accounting. And then one of those two is going to do much better in our economic climate than the other. And that's based off of their natural talents, right? So both of them can be go-getters and work hard. Both of them can be motivated and put in the time and effort. But one of those talents just won't be rewarded by our economic system the same way as the other. And that doesn't seem as fair either. It just seems like one was lucky enough to be born with a certain talent, while the other was born with a more marketable talent. Okay, so hopefully now you feel at least a little bit of the pull here. A lot of this is due to luck, and that really doesn't seem fair. So what are we supposed to do about it, right? If all of this really is pure luck, and we agree that pure luck should not affect uh, our life opportunities so drastically, well, then what are we supposed to do to correct for it? So, just to be extremely clear here, Rawls isn't calling for massive redistribution of wealth from the rich to the poor or anything like that. Right? So, uh, just because he thinks this is all luck, doesn't mean he thinks everybody who has good luck should have all of their money taken away and given to the people who have bad luck, right? Uh, it's not that he's going for a complete equality of resources. That's not necessary, and it might have other bad consequences, right? If we took um, all of the money from our entrepreneurs and business owners and gave it to the people in the lower working class, you might de-incentivize, disincentivize people from uh, pushing forward and trying to take on the entrepreneurial tasks. And so there's a question about capitalism and its motivation on people. So we don't need just massive redistribution. What Rawls is saying isn't that everybody needs equal resources. He's saying everyone should at least have an equal opportunity. That's still going to require a lot of change from where we currently are, but it's not the same as just redistributing of money. So one clear example of how uh, we have to restructure if we value equal opportunity is that we're going to have to restructure the education system pretty radically. Right? So to have equal opportunity, to have equal chances in life, you're going to need an equal education with everybody else. And, so, uh, and that's particularly true if you think about the way children's life opportunities unfold. Right? We don't think a child should suffer just because they were born into a poor economic class with a poor school system. Uh, so if we're going to fix the school system and make it so that everybody gets an equal and satisfactory education, right, this is going to require some wealth redistribution. Right? So we might have to take some from the upper class and give it to the poor uh, school systems, but it's not the same as just redistributing wealth here. We're trying to redistribute some wealth so that we can equalize everybody's opportunities. Now, this is just a sort of rough go at one of Rawls's major points. Right? We have to take account of this birth lottery, and here's some suggestions for how we could do it. In the lectures to follow, we're going to go a little bit more in depth, uh, because he's going to say we need to find principles that all of us could agree to if we're going to try and find equal opportunity. Right? So it can't just be like Plato's philosopher king comes in, stamps his foot down, and says this is what's best for society. Rawls realizes that we all have uh, disagreements about what's best for society. And so the principles we decide on in order to account for this good or bad luck uh, are going to be very important. We're going to have to get to them in a specific way. But we'll see that in the next lecture. So thank you, everyone.